Last time on Through the Bible, King Josiah was killed by King Necho of Egypt. So, what happens now? Will Israel continue to turn to God, or will they return to their wicked ways? That's what we're going to find out as the Bible bus pulls up to the 11th chapter of Jeremiah, starting at verse 6. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'm so glad that you're here for another intriguing Bible study with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. As we continue to learn about the spiritual state of Israel in the time of Jeremiah, I'd like to ask you to join with me and with our World Prayer Team members in praying for the ministry of Through the Bible in Israel today. It has been so hard to try and complete the five-year study of Through the Bible in Hebrew, again, harder than any language that we've had to do, and we're still not successful. So for this reason, our messages are suspended while we're prayerfully seeking the right people to help us move ahead. So as we pray, let's ask God to open the right doors at the right time for us to resume teaching in Hebrew. And we're mindful of the fact that it's God's timing and his will that we desire, and we seek to share his name in Israel and around the world. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and the opportunity that we have to hear it so thoroughly and clearly explained. We ask, Lord, for your blessing on Through the Bible's ministry throughout the world, especially in Israel. We ask that you'd raise up leaders who can translate and produce these programs. And as you prepare the right people to direct the ministry, please soften the hearts of those who will hear the broadcast so that they'll surrender to the love of Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now turn to Jeremiah 11 as Dr. McGee takes us through the Bible. Now today, friends, we begin in the 12th chapter. And I'd like, as usual, to tie it back in to the last study that we had. You'll recall that we said that when the law, the book of the law, was found in the temple and it was read to the people that it had such a profound effect on this man, Josiah, he called the people in and had them make a covenant that they would keep that law. And that law, by the way, is found beginning in the 21st chapter of Exodus and the 22nd and the 23rd chapter, and actually all the way through to the giving of the instructions for building the tabernacle in chapter 25. And what we have here is a man's relationship to his neighbor, his relationship to the person of others and also the property of others and how he should conduct himself as God's man. And they took an oath that they would keep it. But the thing that happened was that this revival was largely a surface revival, but it's no question but what the words of Jeremiah had its effect. And there were many that had in genuine sincerity turned to the Lord. And we, again, would lift out verse 6 of chapter 11. Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and do them. Now, what happened was the people promised, of course, that they would do this. But the fact of the matter is, that it wasn't long that deterioration set in. After the revival, why things began to wear off, that is, the spiritual, and the people began to return to their old ways. And even Josiah made a very grave blunder. He went out against the king of Egypt, the pharaoh, Necho, and they fought at Megiddo, and at the battle of Megiddo, why Josiah was fatally wounded, and he died. And Jeremiah, we're told, mourned at this. Over in Second Chronicles, the 35th chapter, at verse 25, I read just this. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. This man, Jeremiah and Josiah, obviously both young men, and this man, Josiah, died as a young man. Jeremiah wept bitterly because he knew what was going to happen, that the people would not only return back to idolatry, but they would sink farther down in immorality, which, of course, they did. And he gives them a message that, of course, they didn't want to hear. But now 
We saw last time here in the last part of chapter 11, he had to leave his hometown of Anathoth. Josiah would have protected him had he been alive, but now Josiah's gone. And what has happened, Jehoahaz comes to the throne. He actually was an uncle. His mother's name was Hamutal, and he only reigned for three months. But that period, he's given over to total iniquity and evil doing. And then after him, why Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, was made king of Judah by Pharaoh Necho, the king of Egypt. And in return for this appointment, Jehoiakim, he taxed the land and he paid tribute to Egypt. And it wouldn't be long until Nebuchadnezzar would defeat the Egyptian king and Jehoiakim then became the vassal of Babylon for three years after which he rebelled against the king, and that was against the warning of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah also warned against an alliance with Egypt as a false confidence. And the very sad thing was that Jehoiakim would, of course, pay no attention to him, and he became even more corrupt than any before him, so that We're entering now into a very evil period in the life of the nation, and the only light now left is this man, Jeremiah. And added to that, after Jeremiah was forced to leave his hometown, and this young king, Josiah, is slain, and these evil men come to the throne, and conditions get worse. He has what I believe every honest Christian has Doubts come into his mind and in his heart. There'll be those dark thoughts that are going to come to you, and you're going to wonder about why God permits certain things. I have a notion that every preacher who stood for the things of God wonders at times why God does not move. There are those moments of doubt, and every pastor, he looks around and sees how his people are suffering And it's his best people. It's the more spiritual folk. They seem to be having more trouble. I was riding with a lawyer and his wife up in Oakland, California the other day. And she brought out that. And she, by the way, has a radio program for children that goes out over this country today. And she raised the question. She says, it just seems in our church that it's the godly people that are having the trouble today. Why does God permit that? That's a question that comes to every one of God's children, I think. David, you remember, raised that question. He saw the wicked spreading themselves like a green bay tree. And listen to this man, Jeremiah, now. Chapter 12, verse 1. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them, yea, they've taken root. They grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins, that is, from their house. Oh, they talk about you, Lord, but they're far from you, and they prosper. Why do you permit that? That was his question. By the way... Want to know something? That's my question. I'd like to ask God that today. Lord, why do you permit it? And I don't have the answer. I don't think that Jeremiah got the answer either. I don't think David ever got the answer. Oh, he got an answer, but that question was an answer. God permits the wicked. They prosper. They're the rich today and you see them prospering, and they are spreading themselves right now like a green bay tree. Why does God permit that? And another friend of mine, he and I are both in radio, and we were talking about, why doesn't God make some of the Christians wealthy who really want to support our radio program and help us to expand? Why doesn't God do that? That's a question. I've asked him that. And I have to say, I don't have the answer. I'll read, though, what Jeremiah says here. 
Verse 2, thou hast planted them. They've taken root. Now listen, verse 3, but thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and tried mine heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. Jeremiah says, why don't you judge them? They're the ones to be judged. How long shall the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The beasts are consumed, the birds, because they said he shall not see our last stand. And now this is his question. Lord, why do you permit it? And the answer that he gets is this answer, and it's the answer that I accept today, and you may not accept it, but this is the best we have. God says, I know what I'm doing. You trust me. You rest in me. And as he began this passage, righteous art thou, O Lord. My friend, Whatever God's doing today, and some of the things just look very peculiar to me, it's right. He's going to be able to show you that someday, and that's where faith comes in. We walk by faith and not by sight. And now God says this to Jeremiah. He almost rebukes this young man now. And you can see the position of the young man. Josiah was his friend, the king. And Josiah's heart was moved. And these two young men, I think, were used to God to bring in a great revival. I've often wondered if God won't raise up a young man in this country who won't listen to anyone down here. He won't try to curry the favor of Washington or of the educational institutions or of even the so-called Christian public. He's just going to stand up and preach the word of God and go into demand righteousness and do you know, I think that God could do that in our day. And if he did, that would save this country. And that's the only thing that's going to save this country will be that sort of thing. Well, now, Jeremiah, he's left alone and things are getting worse. Jehoahaz, now Jehoiakim is on the throne. They're corrupt rulers. Things are getting worse. What's going to happen? This is the thing that he had even said back in chapter 11, verse 16, the Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. And Paul, you remember, quotes that over in Romans. Paul says that the good olive tree, it's been cut off and set aside. And that's exactly what God did to these people. And now today, God is out of that root. He's bringing forth a wild olive tree. That's you and that is I. We are the church today. That's grafted into the root, and that root is Christ. He's the root out of a dry ground, and he brings life. And that's the thing. And God goes on to say here, I'll take care of this. I'll be the one that will deal with this. And the question of this man is, how long shall the land mourn? Lord, why don't you move? Now, this is interesting what God says to him. Verse 5, if thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? The whole thing is just simply this. He says, Jeremiah, if you are troubled now by what things are going to happen, and you'll forgive me, I'm not trying to be irreverent, but God is saying actually this to him, he says, you ain't seen nothing yet, Jeremiah. It's going to get lots worse. Now, if this has troubled you, what are you going to do when it really gets bad? And I think, friends, it's really going to get bad today, and we may not have the answer, but I hope it'll draw you close to God because he does have the answer, and that's the important thing. Now, God says here very candidly, verse 9, Mine heritage is unto me as a speckled bird. The birds round about are against her. Come ye assemble all the beasts of the field, come to devour. Now, he says here, Jeremiah, you're a speckled bird. You see, every crow thinks her, you know, little offspring is blacker than any other crow. But here an egg hatches out and speckle. Well, that sort of tells you something, doesn't it? And that's the way this boy Jeremiah was. They said, we thought you were for us, one of us, and you're not, you're speckled. 
And that's what I am. I'm a speckled bird, too. I have a notion some of you folks are speckled birds. You're standing for God. You're a speckled bird today. And that's what God is saying to Jeremiah. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. He says, you just well make up your mind, Jeremiah. You're a speckled bird if you stand with me. Now, he goes on to say, though, that there is a day coming, verse 15, it shall come to pass after that I have plucked them out, I will return and have compassion on them, and I will bring them again, every man to his heritage and every man to his land. Why is it that the rich are prospering? God says, Jeremiah, I'll take care of that. What's going to happen? They're going into captivity, but I have remembered the land, and I'm going to bring them back into the land. What a message this was. Now in chapter 13, here's another great chapter, and I think it's one of the most interesting. And again, even with things as serious as they have become, you can't help but smile. You know what it is? It is here, the parable of the girdle. Now that, my friend, is something. Here's the parable of the girdle. Let me read verse 1 of chapter 13. Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and get thee a linen girdle, and put it upon thy loins, and put it not in water. Now that is something, and you can't help but smile at this. I don't know whether Jeremiah was putting on weight or not. I think he was losing weight. But God says to him, now you get a girdle, and you wear a girdle. And it wasn't because he's getting fat, because a girdle wasn't worn for that purpose in that day. And I'd be very Frank, with your girdle is used today to try to maintain an hourglass figure where it's more like a barrel and not an hourglass. But nevertheless, in that day, a girdle was something that you wore to hold up the garments that you have in order that you might work. And that's the reason the Lord Jesus says their loins girded about, that is, ready for service. And the girdle is a sign of service. And you remember that he girded himself with a linen cloth and began to wash the disciples' feet. And it has a twofold meaning. He, the great servant, is preparing them for service by washing their feet so they could have fellowship with him. And if you don't have fellowship with him, you can't serve because service is fellowship with Christ. It's not teaching a Sunday school class or singing a solo or preaching a sermon. It's fellowship with Christ doing what he wants to do and being cleansed. God doesn't use dirty cups or dirty vessels. Now we find here that he's told to do something quite interesting with this girdle. The Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins. Rise, go to Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole of the rock. So I went and hid it by Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. There's always been some question of whether Jeremiah actually went down and hid the girdle. I think he did. There was traffic in that day and going to and fro between nations. And I think he traveled down there and made this trip, did this very unusual thing, came back and told people, so where you been, Jeremiah? Says, been down to Babylon. Says, what have you been doing down there? You've been down there as a representative of the king? He said, no, I had nothing to do with that. They said, well, uh, did you go down there on a business trip? Said, no. Well, he said, why'd you go down there? He said, I went down there to hide a girdle. Now, friends, I think the crowd would laugh at that. Now, what does it mean? Verse 8, then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, after this manner, I will mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. He was told to wear that girdle and it get dirt. Don't wash it. Just let it get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. And finally gets so dirty, I don't think he could wear the thing any longer. Now God says, take it down to Babylon. Now, what does it all mean? It all means just one thing. God says, these people, because they're continually sinking into iniquity, they'll reach the place where there's no hope for them, and then I'm going to send them down into Babylonian captivity. Pretty impressive here. <laughs> and may I say to you, God uses some very funny things. This is a girdle we're talking about. Verse 16 of chapter 13, Give glory to the Lord your God before he cause darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains and while you look for light. 
He turned it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. What God is saying to these people is getting nighttime now and it's going to be dark and you won't know where to go because you're lost in the mountains. And he makes it very clear what he's going to do. Verse 19, Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall be wholly carried away captive. Now, what is going to happen? Verse 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. And today it's impossible for an unsaved person to do good. All of these do-gooders today are not pleasing God. Until you do it in the name of the Lord Jesus for his glory and honor, you are doing it for yourself for a very selfish reason. And the psychologist can take you apart and show how selfish you really are when you're doing it like that. Now, we have in chapter 14, and we just get a foot in the door, we have here the fact God sends a drought, and that drought was a warning to the people as they're sinking now back into sin under Jehoiakim. Now God is saying to them, I'm sending a drought. That's a warning to you that you should turn to God. Now, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. And it was a pretty big one, you see. And it had happened way back in the reign of Ahab. You remember Elijah's the one at that time was God's messenger. Well, now here again, and Jeremiah is the messenger for the southern kingdom. Now, verse 7, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake, for our backslidings are many, We've sinned against thee, and the prophet goes to confess the sins of the people. Verse 13, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophet say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, for I will give you assured peace in this place. And as you know that everyone now is predicting prosperity in the future, there's going to be peace in the world same old cliches, and today this crowd, this intellectual crowd, this sophisticated crowd, think this is something new. Well, my friend, they've been singing this song from the very beginning, evil men can't bring peace on this earth. That's what God's been trying to say for a long time, and hard-headed mankind, and with a sinful and hard heart, he just can't take it in. We're going to continue that next time. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Despite what's going on in the world, we praise God that true peace can be found by trusting in Jesus Christ. You can learn more about how you can have that peace through a relationship with God when you visit ttb.org and search for How to Know God. There you'll find many free resources from Dr. McGee that explain this wonderful gift of salvation. And if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior through this ministry, or maybe God's doing a new work in your life because of what you're learning as we go through His Word together, would you write and let us know that? We love to hear stories, stories about how God is blessing you through your study of His Word. So write to us today by email over at biblebus at ttb.org, or you can mail your letter to Box 7100. Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. I'll be checking and hoping to receive yours. And if you'd prefer, you can also record your story in a message to us when you call 1-865-BIBLE. Now, at the beginning of the program, I mentioned a group of people who faithfully pray for this ministry, and they're called the World Prayer Team. And as we go, I want to thank the thousands of you who faithfully partner with us in getting the word out in more than 250 languages. As you know, your prayers are a vital part of keeping this ministry on the radio as well as online, on satellite TV, and in developing the many apps and other delivery methods that God is using to reach His people with His Word. If you want to learn more about how you can join this committed group of prayer warriors or how you can financially partner in this mission to share God's whole Word with the whole world, visit us at ttb.org forward slash give or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Again, that's one 800 652 4253 or ttb.org. Well, in our next study, we're going to discover Jeremiah's remedy for loneliness and rejection. 
How's that for relevance for today? Join us as our exciting five-year study of the whole Word of God continues right here on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. Today's study is always available, free to stream or download, thanks to the generous and faithful investments from your fellow Bible bus travelers. Just go to ttb.org or download our app to listen again anytime. As always, we'd love to know what's God teaching you.